Welcome to Right on the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use to help you maximize your money and optimize your financial future. Before moving forward with any of the ideas discussed on the show, always consult your financial advisor, insurance professional, or tax consultant. Looking for financial help or a second opinion? We can help you in your search. And now, your host of Right on the Money, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator, Steve Savant. Well, welcome everyone to a glimpse into the golden years of retirement. And for most Americans, you can't plan for retirement without talking about America's number one retirement plan, Social Security. And to help us understand our Social Security benefits, retirement speaker and best-selling author, Tom Hagna. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you. I'm glad you're here. And uh, I've seen your Social Security uh, show for consumers. You also have a huge one for advisors. And I have to say, right out of the get-go, uh, you know, things have changed. We're talking, what's the, people, when they hear the history, they're blown away yeah. by the beginning of Social Security. Why don't we walk through that, and then we'll talk a little bit about the future solvency for it. Yeah, so the history of Social Security is very interesting. It I is. mean, if you really go back, the first Social Security started in uh, Germany in 1889 with Otto von Bismarck, all right? And and he uh, he set up uh, basically an insurance type program for seniors. The retirement age was 70, but the average lifespan was age 48. So it worked just fine. It really started in America back in 1935 hmm. during the Roosevelt administration. And this was really a response to the Great Depression because it was seniors that were hurt by the Great Depression. Hmm. The real debate was, should this be an entitlement program or should this be an insurance program? Should it be welfare type or should it be where you pay in and you have your own insurance program. That was really the argument back in the mm -hmm. in the 1930s. Well, the, the subcommittee group was headed by Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins. And I'll tell you what, if you want to do a, a lesson in courage, you study Francis Perkins. She pushed Social Security through at a time when women were not cabinet secretaries, okay? Mm -hmm. And this was unconstitutional. There's nothing in the Constitution about Social Security. So she not only had to push it through Congress, she had to push it through the Supreme Court. And she did, but she was working for FDR at the time. FDR wanted a program that citizens contributed based on earnings. He did mm -hmm. not want a welfare program. He did not want an entitlement program. Citizens could take pride in collecting the benefits they had purchased, and he wanted it to be self-financing. So this should not be any government funding for mm -hmm. Social Security. That's what he wanted, okay? Secretary of the Treasurer, um, Morgan, Henry Morgenthau, he also wanted the insurance program. So Roosevelt wanted an insurance program. The Secretary of the Treasury wanted a, a, an insurance program. But Secretary of Labor, Labor France and Francis Perkins, she presented one that was more like an entitlement program. Well, Roosevelt wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said, nope, I want an insurance program. He said, modify the proposal because it's the same old welfare program under a different name. And he did not want that. Remember, we're talking about FDR. FDR, okay. who's a Democrat, Democrat. Right, right. right. And so Congress passed the legislation that was submitted by Roosevelt. And the initial Social Security program that was passed was this insurance program where you contributed. Tax collection started in 1937 and benefits started up in 1942. But now the Supreme Court got involved, mm. all right, because this was unconstitutional. Could the U.S. create a mandatory old age insurance program? And here's what they found. Tax could be imposed under the taxing power of the federal government. And payments to the elderly could be justified by the power to promote the general welfare, but they couldn't be linked. So you can tax and you can help old people, but you can't tax to help old people. Uh -huh. This was the problem. And so what happened was the Supreme Court found it constitutional, mm -hmm. but they evaluated all the different parts separately, and they, appro they approved them separately. But the program they approved was more the entitlement program, not the one that everybody thought mm -hmm. had passed. But see, the Americans didn't know that. They thought it was an insurance program. Roosevelt told them it was an insurance program. That's what passed the Congress, but that's not what passed the Supreme Court. So... On August 15th, 1935, President Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act, and he said, we can never insure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-ridden old age. And there mm. you got the Social Security program, and the first person to get a check was a lady by the name of Ida Mae Fuller. Now remember, Social Security retirement age was 65. Life expectancy was 65. She lived to be age 100. 
You're kidding. No. Me. And she paid in a total of $24.75. All in? All in. Her first check was $22.54, and she got paid over $22,000 on an initial contribution of $24.75. Great rate of return. <laughs> Your Social Security won't be that generous, I promise you. Oh, yeah. So that was the history of Social wow. Security. Well, when we're talking about the history of Social Security, of course, in our day, and I know Reagan did a lot in the 80s to, to kind of bolster it, kind of put, yep. you know, fortify it. But now we're heading into the future of Social Security, and there's a lot of question. You know, people are talking about solvency. Um, you always uh, said that many of our old uh, uh, retired elderly seniors are actually taking a 62 because they fear that the yeah. solvency isn't going to be there. Well, I say to everybody, look, Social Security will be there, all right? I could fix Social Security in less than 15 minutes for the next 100 years. I say Social Security is going to be a relatively easy fix. Medicare, Medicaid, not an easy fix, but it's going to be a relatively easy fix. Um, and we can talk about mm -hmm. that. Let, let's kind of look into this. So how, how does Social Security work? Well, both you and your employer pay in out of your paycheck, every paycheck, 6.2% for Social Security up to 118,500 and 1.45% each unlimited for Medicare, all right? A generation contributes to this Social Security fund, the fund earns interest and a generation begins to draw from it. You collect taxes from the current generation to pay for the current benefits. So a lot of people think that they're paying in. I hear people say this, I paid into Social Security for 35 years. That's mm -hmm. my money. No, it's not your money, okay? Your money went to pay for your parents' Social Security. So there's no fund in a there's box. There's no fund okay. in a box right, that okay. you've been paying into. You pay money, it pays for your parents' Social Security. And who's going to pay for yours? Your kids. No, that's, they used to have a partition between the government's actual budget and the Social Security trust fund. Yeah, there's what no happened? more budget, all right? And there's really no more trust fund. What there is is a bunch of IOUs sitting in there the government went in there and they took the money out and they took out 50 million they wrote iou 50 million and then the next year they came in and took out 100 million they wrote iou 100 million so there's this box full of ious but there's no money in the box all right yeah. well this all works fine as long as the working population is large compared to the retired population or if the working population is growing and it grew with the baby boomers and it grew with women entering the workforce think about it mm -hmm. women back in the 20s weren't in the workforce well now they're in the workforce and so the it grew and so it worked just fine and but now the baby boom generation is getting older they're living longer and so the ratio of workers to retirees is dropping rapidly and will continue to drop so mm -hmm. back in the 40s there were 42 people working for every person who was retired well that's now down to 2.9 and it's going to go even lower 2.1 steve when you're drawing your social security benefits there's only going to be two people paying your benefit could this be one of the reasons why even from a political standpoint we're we're letting immigration, we're letting people in here just to pay for this. Yeah. So I, I say on this slide, what this slide tells you is one of two things. Either women need to have more babies right. or we need to have more immigration. That's right. what that's telling you. Right. You need more younger people in the workforce to pay for the retirees. Japan is in a huge problem because they don't allow mm -hmm. immigration, right? And, and they have an aging population mm -hmm. and no babies being born. They're in a huge problem. Right, so the original 65 age, hardly everybody was dying before that when they've invented this, and it was 40 plus Americans for every one worker. Right. So the theory was right back in the day, but we changed the rules of engagement. The stats changed. Right. It worked fine. When life expectancy was 65, the retirement age could be 65. But now what's life expectancy? 80, 85, and we raised it to 67. Obviously, the, the, the retirement age is going to mm. have to go up at some point. Well, when I'm looking at this now, so, so from a solvency point of view, your biggest futuristic look, your prediction, is basically we're going to have it. It's just that the benefits aren't going to be the same as what we're enjoying today. Right. Let's look at, you mentioned Ronald Reagan. Back mm -hmm. in 1983, Ronald Reagan, Republican, worked with Tip O'Neill, Democrat, and they fixed Social Security for a generation. What did they do? They raised the retirement age from 65 mm -hmm. to 67. I don't remember anybody revolting on that. No. And because, look, the way that the reason is because it was both parties. You mm -hmm. see, the Republicans can't fix Social Security and the Democrats can't fix Social Security. They got to do it together because mm -hmm. otherwise they're going to say, oh, look what they did. Oh, look what they did. Oh, they're trying to cut you. They're trying to hurt you. And it's all this political sniping mm -hmm. back and forth. They got to come out. Here's the answer. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're, we're basically going to have to raise the retirement age, not on you, Steve, but on your kids. Mm -hmm. um, cost of living is probably going to have to be lower and slower. It's going to be anyway because we're going to be in a more deflationary economy. 
and we probably got to raise the limit on taxes from 118,500 maybe to 150, 160,000. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to do some things that that aren't going to make Republicans happy. They're not going to make Democrats happy, but we got to do it for Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Bernie Sanders says, lift the cap altogether, just tax those billionaires, uh, you know, on Social Security. But is it really fair mm -hmm. to have somebody pay $200, $500, 20 million dollars to get a $25,000 benefit when they retired? That's not fair either. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in between is the right answer. We got to raise the retirement age and the kids. We've got to, mm -hmm. um, you know, raise that cap a little bit on taxes, I think. And, and I think we can fix it for the next 100 years. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our second segment, we're going to talk about the, la the last year's changes in Social Security. Pretty dramatic. We'll be right back after the break. The number one fear of American seniors is outliving their money in retirement. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. The Guinness Book of World Records for Living the Longest is held by Gene Kalman, who lived 122 years, 164 days. And that's a fact. But it seems like science fiction to consider living to age 150. But according to a leading gerontologist, that person has already been born. Every day in America, seniors are turning age 100. It's the fastest growing segment among retirees today. And tomorrow, you may very well be one of them. Could your retirement plan go beyond age 90, age 95, or even age 100? Now you can purchase guaranteed lifetime income no matter how long you live. And that income can also include annual increases to help maintain the purchasing power of your retirement dollar. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free income calculator to determine how much guaranteed lifetime income you can purchase. Well, welcome back to Ride on the Money, and we're talking about America's number one retirement program, Social Security. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about last year's changes in Social Security. Tom, with Tom Hagna, national rec nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. And I have to say, Tom, uh, there were some changes, and uh, they affected me directly, and they affected a lot of poor, unknown, poor, and lower-middle-class Americans more than anybody. Yeah, they impacted me too, Steve, you know, but there's, there are some um, things before I get into the changes, let me just talk about something that I think, you know, a lot of people don't understand. And that's the survivor benefits of social security. Mm -hmm. And, and let me explain how the survivor benefit works. If you have a husband or wife, whoever has the highest benefit, that's the survivor benefit, mm -hmm. which is why we say that if you have a husband and wife, the breadwinner, whoever earns the most should wait till 70 before they collect their social mm -hmm. security benefit. Because if they take their benefit early, they lock their, their, their spouse into a lower survivor benefit. But you can collect survivor benefits as early as age 60, not 62, 60. A lot of people don't know that. Even earlier if they're minor children in the home. But here's the strategy a lot of people don't, don't know. You could take your survivor benefits at age 60, meanwhile letting your own benefits grow to age 70 and then at age 70 switch to your own benefit. Mm -hmm. Or if it works better, you can start with your benefit at age 62 and then switch to the higher survivor benefit at age 66. So these are just a lot mm -hmm. of little things that people don't now know. Now this hasn't, that, that's been in there. That, that has changed. not changed. That okay. has not changed. Okay. So here is what has changed, all right? There's some strategies. One strategy is called file and suspend. That's changed. Another strategy is called file a restricted application. That one's changed. So let me explain the strategy, and then let me tell you what the changes are. File and suspend works best if you have a couple with very different incomes. So maybe the husband made the majority of the money. The wife was in and out of the workforce helping with the kids. She mm -hmm. may have a work record. She may not. If she has a work record, at age 62, she can file for benefits, okay? He should not. Mm -hmm. At age 66, he will file for benefits, but he won't take them. He'll file and suspend. Why does he do that? Well, now she can step up to a higher mm -hmm. spousal benefit, all right? He lets his continue to grow till age 65 or age 70, and then at age 70, he takes the maximum and when he dies she gets that as a survivor benefit that's called file and suspend well here's the change you must turn age 66 and file and suspend prior to april 30th of 2016 mm -hmm. if you do not turn age 66 and if you do not file and suspend by april 30th of 2016 that strategy goes away mm -hmm. and i miss that 
Me too. By a couple of years. Wow. Me too. Well, we'll talk about the the filing. Of the, the next one's not that bad. It changed, but it's not as bad. Right. So it's file a restricted application. Now, file a restricted application works best if you got a power couple. So you got both husband and wife made money. Mm-hmm. Maybe the husband made more. Maybe the wife made more. It doesn't really matter. But let's say at age 66, she starts taking her benefits. He does not. Mm-hmm. He was going to wait anyway. Well, guess what? While he's waiting, you know what he can do? Hmm. He can file a restricted application to get half of hers. So while between 66 and 70, he's getting a check, but he's getting a check equal to amount half of hers, okay? Mm -hmm. She gets hers and he gets an amount equal to half of hers. He lets his continue to grow to 70, and then at 70, he takes the maximum, and if that's the highest, that'll be the survivor benefit. Now, here's the change. You must turn age 62 by December 31st of 2015. If you turn age 62 by December 31st of 2015, you're grandfathered in. Mm-hmm. And when you turn full retirement age, you can file a restricted application or any time after that. So there will still be people filing restricted applications for the next eight years. Mm-hmm. But if you do not turn age 62 by December 31st, 2015, you're out. Okay. I'm out. That's right. I guess we're out. 215 is already out. gone. And we're just reviewing it and... Let's talk about collecting on your ex because I find this to be fascinating and I want you to take your time on this because I think a lot of women could benefit from this. Absolutely. Look, here's how collect on your ex works. You have to have been married 10 years, divorced at least two and not remarried. So married 10, divorced two, not remarried. You can collect on your ex's social security benefit. Mm-hmm. Now I was doing, a, I do a lot of public seminars, Stephen. I was doing a public seminar and lady raised her hand. She said, Tom, I was married to three different guys for 10 years. and I'm not remarried. Which check do I get? You want to know what the answer? You get the highest of the three. Okay. Whichever one works out best for you. A lot of people don't know that Johnny Carson was married to three different women for 10 years. None of them remarried. All three of them are collecting his maximum survivor benefit. Wow. So all three. Yeah. So, Which is uh, another reason why Social Security has problems. All right. So if I did this in reverse, that I I am a female who's now been divorced three times, but married, married right, T- for each person 10 years, I just yeah. have to pick the big, the biggest check. Right. Unbelievable. Right. Now, now here's a pattern I've found, Steve. I have found a pattern of women in their 60s and 70s mm-hmm. who were married in their 20s and 30s. They might have been divorced for 30 or 40 years. They don't even remember the guy. They don't think about the guy. The guy might even be dead. Well, guess what? They can collect on his Social Security benefit. I'll give you a quick example. For the, for the public television special, I had to write a guide on Social Security mm-hmm. benefits. And there was a manager from a financial firm out in Louisiana. He bought these guides, and he was going through it. He was going to train his financial advisor. Well, he learned about this collect on your ex. Well, he's at the grocery store, Steve, and he runs Mm -hmm. into uh, uh, one of his clients who's 60 years of age, and she was struggling. She was making maybe 12 or 13,000 a year. She was an administrative assistant, struggling paycheck Mm -hmm. to paycheck. And he said, hey, weren't you married at one point? She goes, yeah, I was married a long time ago. He said, how long were you married? She said, 12 years. I, I, he said, well, tell me a little bit more. Oh, I don't even care about that guy. In fact, I heard he died about a year ago. And, and the manager said, did you understand you can collect on his survivor benefit? She said, no. He said, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So she goes down to Social Security Administration. She starts getting 13000 a year immediately. She thought she hit the lottery. And I found there's a pattern out there of women in their 60s and 70s who have no idea they're entitled to collect on their ex's Social Security benefit. Tommy, I'm looking at... A couple presidents. This one was my second president of my life, Dwight D. Eisenhower, general to all of us, right? In the military. Uh, he said, "Should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, eliminate labor laws, and farm programs, you will not hear from that party again in our political history." <laughs> I mean, <is laughs> well, they one? call it the third rail, but yes. but look. We're, we're going to have to modify Social mm-hmm. Security. We're going to have to fix it because if we don't, it's, it's going mm-hmm. to blow up on itself. So we've got to do a few things to make it s- stronger. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, Barack Obama, our president, present president, he said we will keep the promise of Social Security by taking responsible steps to strengthen it and not by turning it over to Wall Street. Well, we haven't turned it over to Wall Street. Right. And we have almost, he's got seven years down and he's going to be out in about 12 months And they've done nothing to strengthen it. Right. Nothing. And like I said, this is not something the Democrats can fix. This is not something the Republicans can fix. They got to do it together and they got to come up with the American solution. I have to say, uh, I'm a libertarian by, you know, political stripe. But my good friend, Rand Paul, whom I a lot many times, I kind of like what he says. He says, let's mean test this program. Hey, wait a minute. What are you? You got to be kidding me. I don't like that. No, I I don't either. And I mean, Chris Christie said that too. I don't like that. And I'll tell you... Um, 
you know, is it fair that you pay in? All, and now I feel like I'm saying what we were talking about earlier, but right. I mean, we paid in our whole life, right. right? We paid right. into something. And I think we should at least get our money back, okay? Mm -hmm. If we don't get a return on our money, I can live with mm -hmm. that. If they want to, sure. you know, not give me as much as somebody else, I can live with it. But, but to not give anything, I mm -hmm. think would be wrong. I just think mm -hmm. it'd be wrong. Well, I just want I was on record 15 years ago when I turned the big 5 0 and I said, I will give all my Social Security benefits back to the government if they'll let me take the contributions that I have to put in and my employer and leave me alone. And if I go destitute, that's my problem. And by the way, remember, there are certain groups in our country that were able to opt out of Social Security. And one right. of the biggest ones is the government themselves. Yeah. I mean, think about that. Well, and some teachers and some uh, railroads, I think, have their own retirement. And they got better retirement plans. Military, than, too? Than, yeah, well... Yeah, military? no, military you get, now it's both. There they was a both. while, yeah. there was a while that, that military was different, but now military pays into Social Security as well. Well, I, I think we're going to have to do something, like you said, uh, we're going to have to be reasonable. We're going to have to uh, take steps to go ahead and do this. I want you to listen to one of our most popular uh, presidential candidates right now, Rubio, right? Marco Rubio said, but here's what I would tell people of my generation. I was talking to him, not us baby boomers. He says, I turned 40 this year. There isn't going to be a Social Security. There isn't going to be Medicare when you retire. Forget what you what benefit is it going to look like. There isn't going to be a benefit. There isn't going to be one if we don't make reforms now and save the program now. Yeah, I, I do believe that we have to make reforms. And the longer we wait, mm -hmm. the worse the reforms are going to be. I'll go on record saying this. I don't believe we're going to see much of any increases in Social Security for the rest of our lives. And here's mm -hmm. why. Any increase we see will be sucked up by the Medicare Mm -hmm. Because it's Medicare is a big problem. It's not Social Security. Medicare, Medicaid is going to wipe us out. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show right now on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com, and you can request information from this segment. In our third segment, we're going to talk about how to maximize your Social Security benefits with Tom. We'll be right back after the break. The Guinness Book of World Records for Living the Longest is held by Gene Calmet who lived 122 years, 164 days. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Will you live to be a super centenarian like Gene? Of course, no one knows how long they'll live or if their family history will be any indication of their lifespan, especially in light of constant medical advancements. But the odds are ever increasing that a significant segment of seniors may live to age 100. But without some idea of your life expectancy, it's difficult to make plans for the future, especially for retirement. While there's no exact science in computing how long you live, you can get an idea by taking a life expectancy test. Then you can use the results to create a timeline for your retirement plan. And don't forget, when you take the life expectancy test, always answer the questions as honestly as you can. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the life expectancy calculator so you can get an idea if you're ready for retirement. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money. We're talking about America's number one retirement plan, Social Security. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about how to maximize your Social Security benefits with Tom Hagen, a nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. Well, if you missed yesterday's segment about what they took away from Social Security, we're going to tell you, well, what's left, we're going to help you maximize it. Tom? Yeah, so, you know, look, a lot of people don't know this, but I love to go to Waffle House restaurants, all right? And if you go to Waffle House at 6 a.m., something special happens. You know what happens? The wise men appear. And they all sit around the counter drinking coffee, solving the world's problems. And if you go into Waffle House and ask them, hey, what age should I draw my Social Security benefits? You know what they'll tell you? 62. Haven't been reading the papers. This place is going broke. Get the getting while the getting's good. 62, 62. Yeah, that's the Waffle House answer. Mm -hmm. That's a coffee shop answer. Is that the right answer? That is not the right answer. So what is the right answer. Here's mm. the right answer. In general, the breadwinner should delay. I'll say it again. In general, the breadwinner should delay till age 70. So why do I say in general? Well, because look, everybody's different. You got to look at a number of different things when you're picking out your start date. Um, you know, what's their health? What's their life expectancy? How many work credits do they have? You know, what other financial resources do they have? Some people take it early and invest it. I'm okay with that. But but what I'm not okay with is everybody taking it at 62 because their buddies told them to take it at age 62. So Steve, let me try to explain social security as simple as I can. Right now, the full retirement age is age 66. 
And for every $1,000 a month you take at age 66, if you take it early at 62, you're not going to get $1,000 a month. You're only going to get $750. But if I could get you to wait just a few more years till age 70, you're also not going to get $1,000 a month. You're going to get $1,320. Now let me pull those two out. $750, $1,320. $750, $1,320. $750, $1,320. Mm-hmm. I didn't put cost of living in there. What I'm telling you is you take your check at age 70, it's going to be about double what it is at age 62. And yet too many people are taking it early. Now, we're, they're taking it early. And you said a lot of it's out of fear. They feel like I might as well get the money while we still can. But we're talking about difference between age 62 and 78 years. And this could be a huge number. If you're thinking about longevity, now I, I do admit, people, certain people, they may have a genetic disposition for short life. Maybe their family uh, genetics are not there. But for most people, the average American, the average American, I mean, the male and female, isn't that in their mid to 80s? Well, for a 65-year-old man, it's age 86. For a 65-year-old woman, life expectancy is age 89. For a 65-year-old couple, it's age 93. So when people say, well, I'm not going to live that long. I'm going to take it early. If they're a married couple, I got to look them in the eye and say, it's likely one of you is going to live that long. But here's what I'm saying, Steve. I'm not saying you can't retire at 62. What I'm telling you is you shouldn't take that money at 62. So what you want to do is build a bridge, build an income bridge from Mm -hmm. 62 to 70. Take some other money. Take your IRA money. Take your 401k money. Take your CD money. Take your money market. Build a bridge from 62 to 70, but don't take that money. That money is some of the best money money can't buy. Why? Because it pays you for the rest of your life. When you die, it pays your spouse for the rest of your spouse's Mm -hmm. life. Plus it's inflation protected. See, that's some of the best money Mm -hmm. that money can't buy. Now people say, well, Tom, I'll never break even. Yeah, the chances are you will break even. If you take a look at this, if you take it at age 66 versus 62, the break even is age 76. If you take it at 70 versus 62, the break even is age 79. If you take it at 70 versus 66, the break even is age 81. We already said a man's life Mm -hmm. expectancy at 65 is 86, a woman's is 89, and a couple's is age 93. Now, Steve, look at this. Those orange numbers right there show a husband and wife who took their Social Security benefits early at age 62. It paid them a million bucks. I don't want to make fun Mm -hmm. of a million bucks. A million bucks is a million bucks, right? But look if the breadwinner would have delayed, it would have paid 1.5 million. It matters. That's 50% more. That's $500,000 that this couple left on the table by taking it early. And remember, one thing that I've heard you talk about that you didn't add in your little equation was a hybrid retirement. You might want to be working all the way out to 70. Work a little longer, save a little more. Mm -hmm. You can increase your earnings, increase your savings, increase your Social Security Mm -hmm. benefits, and start the, 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 the withdrawals later. If you can wait till age 70, and of course your qualified plan, you don't really have to take that out till 70 and a half. That's kind of the new benchmark to look at. So if you're talking about hybrid or looking at different ways to bridge from 62 to 70, that's the strategy. And we'll have strategies throughout the year about all right. this. And, and look, in my first book, Paychecks and Playchecks, I got the whole thing on how to do RMDs properly. Most mm-hmm. people are just taking out the required minimum distributions. That's suboptimal. If they would do the required minimum distribution maximization strategy that I lay out on Paychecks and Playchecks, that gives them even more mm-hmm. money. I'll have to have you come back and do that. Now, there are three benefits I want you to understand before you decide on when you should take yours. First is how your benefit works. Here's how your benefit works. You have to pay into Social Security for 40 quarters. Once you pay in for 40 quarters, you're eligible. They will then look at the average of your highest 35 years. And we talked in a previous show why that's important because, you know, if you want to retire at 52 and you only pay into Social Security for 25 years, that means the other 10 years are going to be credited with zero. Uh Maybe you have 35 Mm -hmm. years, but the first five years you were the busboy or a waitress at a restaurant and now you got a high paying job. Maybe you want to have five more years of that job to bump off the five years you or the bus boy or the waitress. The second benefit you need to understand is how the spousal mm-hmm. benefit works. See, you can either take your benefit or half of your spouse's. So let me ask you a question. What if we got a stay-at-home mom? She mm-hmm. paid in zero quarters into Social Security. Can she take Social Security? Yes. She's entitled to half of his. All right? So those are some of the things. And no, I don't. I, I want to make sure we get that because I think a lot of our listeners, our viewers, say, well, I had a stay-at-home mom. And a lot of the boomers, maybe that was a member because our culture was changing at the time. So there's a lot of stay-at-home moms. So they stayed at home. They have little to nothing in Social Security. You're saying they can still get half, if I'm hearing correctly, half of their husband's full retirement age benefit, right? Right. And he's still getting his. And we're taking right. nothing away no, from him. No, they're taking nothing from him. He gets his full benefit. Mm-hmm. She gets an amount equal to half of his. And when he dies, she gets the full benefit. So can I just do the math in my head? If I'm getting 40000 my wife could get another 20000 right. on top of them. So it's 60000 60000 That's that can money. Be, that can be real money. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, you know, both you and your employer pay into Social Security and Medicare. That's how it's set up to, to work. You you pay for 40 quarters, you become eligible, then it's the high, the average of your highest mm-hmm. 35 years. Now, the survivor benefit, you know, we discussed this on a previous show, is the highest of the two. Mm-hmm. So whoever had the highest benefit, that goes to the survivor. OK, mm-hmm. and so, you know, a lot of people don't understand how that works. And you can take your mm-hmm. survivor benefits as early as age 60, not 62, even earlier if they're minor children in the home. And you can start with your survivor benefit at age 60. Let your benefit grow till age 70. Take that. Or if it works better, start with yours at 62 and switch to the higher survivor. At OK, 66. so I really I'm just thinking present law. I'm thinking 60 is a benchmark for survivors. 62 is the front end of when you could pull it out. Your full retirement age for the boomers, at least the front end of the boomers, is 66. It's going up higher, 67, 67 in your generation. for me, yeah. 70 becomes the new demarcation for maximum security benefits. Right. And I think I just heard you say, if I have children that are dependents, I'm assuming 18 and under is what you're saying yep. there, that could even start earlier than that. Yeah, there's there's dependent benefits as well. And so that can play into when you decide to take your, your mm-hmm. benefits because you got to be taking benefits for, for the for those dependent benefits to kick in. So sometimes that there's a reason why you should take benefits earlier, okay, if there's dependents mm-hmm. in that. So that's another consideration. Okay, so if I'm looking at the timeline of Social Security, I mean, excluding the, the, in, the dependent issue for a second, uh, well, I'm looking at 60, 62, 66 or 67, depending upon if you're on the next line of where they're going to move it up, and age 70. Those are your big numbers. Those are big and you years. Gotta, you, and, and you recommend looking at all this to see what is the best way to maximize your benefits. Yeah, and then as we talked about in, in a previous show, then there's the strategies. There's the file and suspend, file a restricted application, collect on your ex. Mm-hmm. Social security is not so simple that you should listen to your buddies at the coffee shop mm-hmm. to take it at 62. <laughs> there's way more strategies involved. I saw something good, Steve. It said, never take financial advice from a broke person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's right. Or, you know, I'm thinking about, because Social Security is so important to most Americans, and I'm thinking that over a half of the American population, this is their only plan. So to know, have knowledge on this is a huge issue. And a lot of us, I, I'm trying to prepare my retirement. And some of us have done a little bit of savings. Some have done more than that. But for most of Americans, lower middle class and to down to poor people, they have not done this. So doing what we're talking about, and we have information on all this that you can right. get, get, we'll happen to give it to you. So remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request this very information. will really help you. And in our fourth segment, we're going to talk about the qualifications and requirements of Social Security benefits with Tommy Hagner. We'll be right back after the break. Over 50% of those who have life insurance may be in the wrong rate class and more than likely are paying too much for their coverage. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Sometimes you just need a second opinion to determine if you're actually getting the best deal. The insurance industry has just updated the mortality tables to reflect longer life expectancy, so premiums are expected to go down. And additionally, there are life insurance companies that are more benevolent if you have a medical problem than other companies. And when you consider that most life insurance companies offer lifestyle credits for those who practice good living habits, well, you could save a lot. But an additional value here is the vast majority of life insurance companies offer a free blood and urine analysis, a test that costs hundreds of dollars and with no obligation to buy. With hundreds of life insurance companies competing for your business, you could pay substantially less. So if you have a life insurance policy and you want a second opinion, just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the life insurance for a second opinion. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money, and we're talking about America's number one retirement program, our plan, national plan, Social Security. Tom, we're talking about this. And when I think about this, I've been a syndicated columnist now for about, I don't know, about maybe a really syndicated, seven, about six, seven years. I've been sitting there doing color commentating. We do not understand our own retirement plan. And I want to talk about the earnings qualification, the requirements, because I think we need to walk through this because if we don't do this, we're hurting ourselves. Right. And so we'll talk about the, qual- the earnings qualifications. And then there's now this there's this earnings test where they mm-hmm. can take back some of your benefits. So we'll, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. we'll take it back. Oh, yeah, they can take it back. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So wow. look, to, to qualify, and we've kind of gone over this a little bit, but let, let's just review it. Both you and your employer 
pay in 6.2% up to the first Mm -hmm. $118,000 of your income, all right? You also each pay 1.45% unlimited towards Medicare. Hey, if you're you're a single employer, you're doing both. Right, and me, I'm self-employed. I'm doing both sides of that, and that's a lot of money. Wait, if you think the rate of return is bad for a a W-2 employee, what about self-employed? Yeah, and they don't give the self-employed any type of credit for that either. There should be some deduction on the rest of the taxes. So so then you only get the single side of that equation. It just adds it on, you know, and so so it's very very tough for for small businesses. Mm. Um, Look, to become eligible, you have to pay in for 40 quarters, so basically 10 years. Once you do that, they're going to look at the average of your highest 35 years, and as we talked about in an earlier segment, you know, if you want to retire early and you only paid in for 25 years, the other 10 years are going to be credited with zeros. Do you really want to have mm-hmm. that in your social security record? Or maybe the first five years that you have, you have 35 years, but mm-hmm. the first five years you were a part-time employee or you were a bus boy or a waitress. Now you've got a high paying job. Maybe you want to have five more years of your high paying job to bump off the five years so that you mm-hmm. get 35 good years. No, okay. No, okay. So, so the minimum, if I'm understanding is, is 10 years or 40 quarters. Yep. Okay. So most of us have worked way more than that. Right. Okay, so they're still going to take the best, what, 35? 30, best 35 years. Quarters. 35 years, yes, not quarters. Years. 35 years. So let's say the average American, you know, I'm thinking I'm in my 30, well, I can't really talk, I'm talking about all the way back to my 20s, right? right. We're talking about, so we've or been even your teens plus. if you're working at a restaurant and yeah. you're, you know, mopping floors like I was. Or, yeah, or, Social or, Security or, coming out. Yep. Yep, those counted. But but what you want to do is you want to get those years off, mm-hmm. and you want to have 35 pretty good years of when you were making money. So your, your big earning years is what you're really trying to maximize. And I've heard you talk about this before. If you think you're a little short, that working that extra five years just before you retire could really be huge. I, I talk about it in, in the book, Don't Worry, Retire Happy. Just working a few extra years can increase your success in retirement by over 50%. You have increased earnings, increased savings, increased Social Security benefits, and decreased spending. So it can have a huge impact on your overall retirement. That's a huge issue. Well, walk us through some of the, the, the additional issues here. Well, look, there's an earnings test. Now, this is different. This is when you retire, okay? Mm-hmm. And this is how the government can take your Social Security benefits back. So let me kind of start from the top and go down. Okay. If if you retire, if you start drawing Social Security at your full retirement age, which right now is age 66, and for younger people, it's 67. That's what's called the full retirement age. If you take your Social Security benefits at your full retirement age or later, there's no penalty. So you get to keep all your earnings mm-hmm. where it's your job and you get to keep all your social security benefits, all right? However, if you take your your social security early, like let's say you take it at 62 and you've got a job where you're making 50 or $60,000 a year and you're still taking your social security, well, there you're gonna give up $1 in benefits for every $2 you earn above 15,720. And then because it's a government, just to make it really complicated, in the year that you turn your full retirement age, so in the year, like if you were turning Mm -hmm. 66 this year, but maybe in December of this year, of of this next year, Mm. then in that whole year, you would give up $1 in benefits for every $3 earned above 41,880. So it's a little complicated. The basic rule is this. If you're making some pretty decent money, you probably don't wanna take your social security benefit early. Wait mm-hmm. till your full retirement age or later. Now, worst case is you took it early. You're making good money. They're taking all this money back. Here's the good news. The money's not lost. Okay, it's not gone. Mm-hmm. They'll add it back into your future Social Security calculations. So your future Social Security calculations will actually go up. Okay, so if I'm, I want to make sure I understand yep. this. They're taking it away. They're, they're looking at your wages. Yep. They're causing a, an issue with your provisional income test for Social Security. And... But they're actually crediting it back in future. In the, in future. the future, they in will the future. credit it back. But okay, now so let's not, not let's be clear losing. of what yeah. counts mm-hmm. as income because look, in our next section, we're going to talk about taxation, and that's a whole other animal. And it people is. get them mixed up all the time. People mix up the earnings test with the taxation all the time. This is earnings. Earnings mean like work income. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what counts? It's your salary. It's your hourly pay. It's your bonus. It's your commissions. It's your severance pay. It's your employer, employee's contributions to a pension or retirement plan. That is earnings, all right? What does not count is investment income, capital gains, annuity income, pension income, government. Pay. So it's earned income that counts. It's not all mm-hmm. of these other things, all right? Limited partnership income doesn't count. Interest received from a loan, dividend income. So any of that investment type income does not count. It will count towards the taxation, but it does not count towards the earnings Mm -hmm. test. So a lot of people get confused. But then again, the good news is the benefits are not actually lost. They're merely deferred. 
Okay, I just want to make sure, though, if you go back again, I just want to make sure we're, we're talking about the same thing and that our viewers, again, if you're uh, listening to the show, you can hop out to our site and actually watch this. Uh, we're, we're showing this up on our uh, uh, screen. When I'm looking at the basics of the things that cause income, I have to understand what that is and what doesn't. And I like the investment. You had the investment. You had annuities on there. I didn't. Is that true? Right. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. So once I understand what causes my I'm losing. You keep telling me I'm losing it, but I get it back. But I'm, I got to look at these two areas so that I can understand yeah. how to, to really plan for this. Income, earned income counts, mm-hmm. other income from investments, capital gains, annuities, pension, government pensions, limited partnerships, all those other things don't count for this. They for will this. count for taxation, okay. but they don't count for this. And I, I, I can't underscore what, uh, what Tommy just said, because all the time we, we get calls from uh, consumers that say, Steve, you guys said it didn't count. I said, yes, for the earnings test. But remember, almost every bit of income, and I can't think of too many. There are a few exceptions to the rule, but most all of it's going to fall in the provisional income test. We'll talk about that in the next segment. Okay, so now I know what t- counts and what doesn't count. I've now prepared to figure out the math. Should I take it at 62? I'm going to try to delay, as you suggested. Uh, and there, there could be reasons why I have to take it. You know, short lifespan, maybe that's my, my Okay, family. but let's talk about that for a minute, because let's say you got a husband and wife. Let's say the husband made more money than the wife and the husband's in bad health. Mm-hmm. Well, he's going to think he should take it early. I would advise that husband not to take it early. You know why? Because his check covers both lives. Mm-hmm. So you got to look at the life expectancy of the two of them. Just because one person has mm-hmm. bad health does not mean that person should take theirs early if they're the breadwinner. Okay, now I want to ask, I want to go back to another segment piece here that, that you just started and just kind of reminded me of something. So if I have a 65-year-old male living to 80 Six, Six yep. and they have a 65 year old female living to 89. You said, Oh, but if they're married, one of those could live to 93. 93. Okay. 50% of them, one of them's okay, going to well, live let's, to 93. Let's go back, because you just, well, let's put the two pieces together. Now, that tells me that marriage somehow has some kind of longevity to it. It's actually adding years. Is that correct? Yeah, well, look, I don't know why, but that's a fact. So, like, the life expectancy of a man who's 65 is age 86. Mm -hmm. Of a woman, it's age 89. And of a couple, it's 93. But let's understand what life expectancy is. That doesn't mean when everybody dies. That's only when half the people die. Half the people live longer than that. That's what life, life expectancy is not an average. Life expectancy is a midpoint. That's mm. only when half the people die. The other half the people live longer than that. So, I mean, people are living a long time. And with medical technology, it's going to keep increasing. Well, that's why I think it's very important. What you said was, hey, listen, maybe maybe father in the equation has issues and he's not going to live long. But really, his wife is the one that's really going to live long. Right. And that's why we have to try to protect her benefit right. as best we can. And his, since he made more money, is the survivor benefit. He should wait, even if he's in bad health. I'm thinking back to a couple segments back when you said Ida actually lived. She got her first Ida check at Fuller. Yep. She got her first check at 65. Yep. She lived to age 100. Yep. Right. And nobody expected that back in the day. Nope. And she'd paid in twenty four dollars and seventy five cents, and she took out twenty two th- over twenty two thousand dollars. And remember the Guinness Book of think World about Records. That. Oh well. And when I think about it, I'm thinking. I was born in the wrong generation. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking about, you know, your, your Guinness Book of World Records. That gal from France lived to 122 years, 164 days. We're going to see, they said on, I think it was Time or Newsweek said, a person that's born today, somebody's going to live to be 142, and that person's born already. 142, and it's in the cover of Time magazine. Wow. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request the information from this segment. In our fifth segment, we're going to talk about the taxation of Social Security benefits with Tom Hagner. We'll be right back. Shakespeare once said, This above all, to thine own self be true. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. It's difficult to make good decisions in life without knowing who you really are. And nowhere in life is this more important than making sound financial decisions. Creating a financial profile addresses your psychological disposition towards money, and that's a critical component in the decision-making process on saving, investing, and using insurance to protect your risk. Establishing your own risk tolerance is the first step in building a financial profile so you can measure your suitability for a financial product or strategy. There may be many risk tolerance tests available that can help you construct your own financial profile. One test that I use is a good place to start, and I'll email it to you free and without obligation. The test will take you about 10 minutes, and you'll be able to do it in the comfort and the privacy of your own home. 
So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free risk tolerance test. Once you calculate the results, you'll have an understanding about your attitude towards money. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money, and we're talking about America's number one retirement plan, Social Security. I am Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about the taxation of Social Security benefits with Tom Hegna, nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. Tom, they said they were never going to tax Social Security. I mean, I've looked it back in the Google history here, and they said they weren't going to tax this. Now, why are we talking about taxing Social Security benefits. They're taxing them, and, and they tax, uh, you know, the tax rates are pretty high, too. The exposure is huge. I don't understand it, and I don't think our seniors understand the impact of all the income that flows over to the provisional income test to see if your Social Security benefits are taxed. Yeah, and let's let's kind of separate what we talked about in the last segment from this one. Oh, the last one, it was all earned income. It was mm. salary and wages and bonuses and commissions. That's what counted towards the earnings test. Mm. This is the taxation. Now, what counts towards the taxation? I used to say everything, mm. but it's not everything. There's a couple of things. Roth IRAs don't count. Uh, income from life insurance doesn't count, but that's about it. So it's almost everything counts, okay? So your CD interest counts, your capital gains counts, your rental property counts, your farm income counts, all of your tax-free bond interest counts, which a lot of people don't know. That yeah, just shocks killer. a lot of seniors, yeah. you know? So everything counts. Okay, your your so pension, half of your own mm. social security benefits count. Now, I noticed that there were two tiers of taxation. And of course, I have noticed in taxable event issues when we're looking at it, I have, I'm in a high tax bracket. I got 85% of my benefits are now exposed to taxation because I'm in a high one. Then what happens? The father dies generally first. Now, mom doesn't have the same exemptions and deductions. So her tax bracket, even though she's not making any more, the actual exposure, it's a stealth tax for seniors, I have to say. Yeah, it is. And so let's kind of get into it. I mean, um, when you receive your Social Security benefits, you may owe taxes on up to 85% of those Social Security benefits. The IRS adds together mm -hmm. all kinds of income. And like I said, almost everything, like Roth IRAs mm -hmm. don't count, life insurance benefits don't count, but there's, there's not much else that doesn't count count, okay? And they use your adjusted gross income plus all of your tax-free bond interest plus half of your social security benefits to come up with the number. When I'm looking at this number, now I, I don't want to cry over spilt milk. It, we're getting taxed. I can complain about it all day long. It's not going to change anything. So when I'm looking at this, there's strategies to be had here. So I really Absolutely. need to think about what income can I defer while I'm taking this? How long can I stretch this out? And there's some elasticity in my thinking because I got a timeline. I'm sitting there. I know I'm going to be taking it no later than 70. Right. But I might have deferral income that I can push off into the future. I might be able to take some loans from maybe my home equity or my cash value life insurance policy. Something to mitigate this time where I can at least bring this earn this, this actual taxable income down. Yes, there are some strategies and let's talk about that. So again, they use your modified adjusted gross income plus all your tax-free bond interest plus half of your social security benefits. Now here's the table. All right. Well, wait a minute. Just before you go on, Tom, I'm yeah. sorry to say, go back to that. Yep. I, I have to say most of Americans until seven, eight years ago, were completely used to looking at when they say, what's your adjusted gross income? We go right down to the bottom of the page of the 1040. That number at the bottom of page one is our number. But today, there are six to seven iterations of modified adjusted gross income, which is on the second page. And when you bring up, it's the modified adjusted gross income, not my adjusted gross income. That's a big wake up call to most Americans. They yeah. have never heard this before. And they're starting to go, I thought it was AGI at the bottom of page one. It's not. It's on this page, like you've said, modified adjusted gross yeah. income plus non-taxable interest. Yeah. So, so almost everything counts, but here's the table I want you to understand. If you're single and you have less than $25,000 of income, or if you're married and have less than $32,000 of income, you will pay no tax on your social security benefits. But if you're rich and the government says you're rich, if you're single and you make between twenty five and thirty four thousand, or if you're married and you make between thirty two and forty four thousand, well now up to fifty percent of your social security benefits can be taxed. Wait a How can that possibly be rich? You just well, told me forty four thousand dollars. Steve, it gets better. If you're ultra rich, like Bill Gates rich, and the and the government says if you're single and you have income over thirty four thousand, if you're married, you have income over forty four thousand, well now you're ultra rich and up to eighty five percent of your social security benefits will All right, be taxed. Just let, let me get this straight. So my wife and I have over 44,000 coming in every year. 
everything above that line is going to be exposed to 85 percent to well, my, no, whatever just, my tax break is. It's even worse than that. 85 percent of your Social Security benefits are going to be added to your taxable income and will be taxed at your rate. So whatever my effective tax bracket is at 85%. I'm of, gonna, of your benefits of would, benefit. be, would be added in to, to count for income. Yeah. So, Unbelievable. So look, um, so let me give you a couple different examples. Let's say that there's somebody who retired from Motorola mm -hmm. and they get, you know, $75,000 a year in their pension. Is there anything I can do to help that person reduce or eliminate tax on their Social Security benefit? No. They're going to be paying tax on 85% of their Social Security benefits. But what if you got somebody who gets $1,000 a month from Social Security, $1,000 a month from pension, $1,000 a month from tax-free bonds, and $1,000 a month from capital gains? Well, you know what? We can get those people from 85% down to zero. Simply by taking some of that tax-free bond interest and moving that into some deferred product or, and moving some of the investments that gave them the capital gains mm -hmm. into a deferred product, even if they need income, they can use one of these income annuities that has an exclusion ratio so you can get the same amount of income, but just not as much taxable. So look, when I was, um, when I was, in, I was you know, a financial advisor for years and I was out in East Mesa where, you know, we used to call it Seizure World. It's Leisure World, but we <laughs> call it Seizure World just kind of for fun. But there's a lot of old people out there. And guess what? I found a lot of middle income seniors that bought tax-free bonds. Do you know why they bought tax-free bonds? Because they thought they were tax-free. They had no idea that their tax-free bonds were causing their Social Security mm -hmm, to be taxed. Mm -hmm. And simply by moving that tax-free bond money over into either a deferred annuity or into a life insurance product or even into an income annuity, I could get them from paying tax on 85% of their Social Security benefits down to zero. And I did a lot of that. In fact... I never even knew about the social mm -hmm. security taxation. I kind of lucked into it when I was a brand new advisor and I was working out there with all mm -hmm. these senior citizens and I started digging into this and I found out there were people who had money in CDs. They didn't even touch their interest. They just left it in the bank. We moved that into a deferred annuity. There were people who had money in tax-free bonds They and that was causing them. So we, by using the products properly, mm -hmm. I was able to save these people thousands and thousands of dollars on their social security taxation. Wow, Tom, I'm telling you, taxation and Social Security is really a bear. And when you have, we have strategies now to be able to mitigate some of this, and you need to look at that with your advisor. Well, that's all the time we have for our show this week. I want to thank uh, Tom Hagen for being my guest. But before I go, remember what the good Reverend John Wesley once said make all you can, give all you can, save all you can. I'm Steve Savant. See you next week, right here on Right on the for more information on this week's money topics, just go to our website at www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and follow Steve's daily postings on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. When it comes to retirement, money management, small business, insurance coverage, college funding, or budgeting, we have the interviews you can use.